Hi, and welcome again to my videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we looked at vibrational energy, and we saw that the quantum mechanical model we use to understand molecular vibrations is called the harmonic oscillator. Today, I want to tell you more about molecular vibrations and what they're like, and we'll start to see that they are a bit more complex than the simple stretching vibration that we looked at last time. First of all, let's think about the number of different vibrations that can occur in a single molecule. If you've taken an organic chemistry course, you probably spent some time looking at IR spectra like this one. As you can see, there are lots of different peaks, and each one corresponds to the frequency of a different vibration in the molecule. As you might imagine, the larger and more complex the molecule, the larger the number of different vibrations that can occur in it. As it turns out, there's a simple formula for determining the number of vibrations that can occur in a molecule. For linear molecules like carbon dioxide or acetylene, the number of vibrations is given by this formula, 3n minus 5, where n is the number of atoms in the molecule. For nonlinear molecules, the number of vibrations is 3n minus 6. For example, if we have a water molecule, there are three atoms, so the number of vibrations is 3 times 3 minus 6, which gives us a total of 3. So, there are three vibrations possible in a water molecule. And if we take an infrared spectrum of water, we can see these vibrations as three peaks in the spectrum. We'll talk a little more about what exactly those three vibrations are a little later in the video. Now, suppose we have a sample of carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a linear molecule with just two atoms, so to get the number of vibrations, we use this formula. So, the number of vibrations is 3 times 2 minus 5, which gives us 1. So there's just one vibration possible for carbon monoxide. Finally, suppose we have a sample of cyclohexane. Cyclohexane has a formula of C6H12, so there are 18 atoms total. That means there are 3 times 18 minus 6 possible vibrations for a total of 48. Here's the infrared spectrum of cyclohexane, and you can see that there are many more peaks than there were for a water molecule. But you can probably tell that although there are several more peaks, it doesn't look like there are 48 of them. That's because some of the vibrations are very similar. For example, here's one vibration that can occur in cyclohexane. If you watch these two carbon-hydrogen bonds, you can see that one gets shorter as the other gets longer, and vice versa. The same is true for these two bonds. But that means that those two vibrations are exactly the same. They just occur between different pairs of identical atoms. That means they'll have the same frequency, so they occur at the exact same location in the IR spectrum. You might recall that when two different energy states have identical energies, we say they are degenerate. So the two sets of vibrations we just saw are degenerate vibrational states. Another important thing to know about vibrations is that in order for them to appear in an IR spectrum, the vibration must cause the electric dipole moment of the molecule to change its size or direction. There was also a similar rule for rotations. In order to appear in a rotational spectrum, you might remember that the rotation had to cause the electric dipole moment around the molecule to change. Think about that as you watch this vibration, which we saw earlier. Since these two bonds go in opposite directions, that is, one gets smaller as the other gets longer, it'll cause the distribution of charges around the center of the molecule to change. In other words, the electric dipole moment will change its size and direction, so this vibration will produce a peak in an IR spectrum. On the other hand, watch this vibration, which we haven't seen yet. In this vibration, bonds on opposite sides of the molecule get longer or shorter at the same time. A cyclohexane molecule is symmetric when its bonds are all at their equilibrium length, which makes it a nonpolar molecule. And when the vibration we're looking at occurs, that doesn't change. Since bonds on opposite sides get longer or shorter at the same time, the molecule continues to be nonpolar overall throughout this vibration. The electric dipole moment, therefore, doesn't change, and so this vibration doesn't appear in an IR spectrum. 
let's think about these vibrations a little more and try to get a good mental picture of the types of vibrations that can occur in a molecule. Let's start with a simpler molecule than cyclohexane. We'll use water as our example. Since water has only one central atom, its vibrations are much simpler than those of cyclohexane. In fact, it turns out that all vibrations are composed of just three simple types, and it turns out water has one of each. The first type of vibration is called a symmetric stretch, and it's what you see here. In this one, the bonds in the vibration get longer and shorter at the same time. Next is the asymmetric stretch. In this one, some bonds get longer at the same time that others get shorter. And finally, there's the bending vibration. In this one, the bond lengths don't actually change at all. Instead, it's the bond angle that gets longer or shorter. We saw earlier that water can only have three vibrations because the formula we learned tells us that for water, 3n minus 6 is equal to 3. And since all three of these vibrations cause the electric dipole moment of water to change, all three of them appear in a spectrum. Now, here's the IR spectrum of carbon dioxide. CO2 is a linear molecule with three atoms, so it can have 3 times 3 minus 5 vibrations, which is 4. But it looks like this spectrum has only two peaks. Why is that? Well, here's one of those four vibrations. You can see that it's an asymmetric stretch because one bond gets longer as the other one gets shorter. Next, here's the symmetric stretch. But notice that unlike the asymmetric stretch, the electric dipole moment doesn't change in this vibration. The charge distribution is symmetric around the center of the molecule throughout the vibration. So this vibration doesn't appear in the spectrum. Now, here's the third vibration. I've rotated the molecule a little to make the vibration easier to see. This one's a bending vibration, and it appears in the spectrum. And finally, here's the fourth and final vibration. You might realize that this is another bending vibration. It's only different from the previous one because the bending is happening in a different plane. Since it's really an identical vibration, it has exactly the same frequency as the previous vibration. So those two vibrations are degenerate, and they appear at the same position in the spectrum. Last, here's a spectrum of methane. Since methane has five atoms, we'd expect there to be nine different vibrations in the spectrum. However, we don't see nearly that many. And now that we've talked about the CO2 spectrum, you can understand why this one has fewer than nine peaks. Some of the vibrations are degenerate, so the peaks appear on top of each other. And some of the other vibrations don't cause a change in the electric dipole moment, so they don't pop up in the spectrum at all. So far, we've looked at very small molecules, like methane, CO2, and water. Larger molecules have more complex vibrations, like the ones in cyclohexane. But actually, those vibrations are really just formed by adding together multiple stretching or bending vibrations, like the ones we just looked at. There's one more thing I want to mention about vibrations before we finish. As you probably know, if we stretch a bond to a very great length, we'll eventually break the bond. What's happening here is that Eventually, the nuclei get so far apart that they no longer both feel attractions due to the electrons in the bond between them. When that happens, the two nuclei separate, and they're not bonded to one another anymore. But remember the harmonic oscillator model we saw? That model doesn't show what I just described. In the harmonic oscillator, the bond can get longer and longer as the vibrational energy increases without ever breaking. That's not realistic. A much more realistic, but mathematically more complicated model, is this one. Instead of a harmonic oscillator, this model is called an anharmonic oscillator, or sometimes also called a Morse potential. Let's look at it more closely. At low vibrational energy levels, this behaves about the same as a harmonic oscillator. 
the bond can stretch and shorten as usual. However, remember that as the vibrational level increases, the two extreme ends of the vibration get shorter and longer. But as the bond gets longer, the atoms are less and less attracted to each other. Eventually, there comes a point where they aren't attracted at all, and at that point, the potential energy levels off. It doesn't continue to go up because the atoms aren't close to each other anymore. And that's why the Morse potential doesn't look like a parabola the way the harmonic oscillator does. So if we raise the vibrational energy level to here, it'll make the bond stretch so much that it breaks and our molecule undergoes a chemical reaction. Well, that's enough new material for now. When we meet again, we'll talk a bit about the shapes of molecules and we'll eventually see that this will help us understand which vibrations cause changes in the electric dipole moment, so we'll be able to understand IR spectra even better. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.